All right, good morning, church. All right, if you guys open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, that's where we're going to be today. Matthew chapter 12. We are in a series right now called Stretch Out Your Hand. And uh, the sermon today, if you're a note taker, you want to write down sermon titles, is called The Blasphemy and Forgiveness. Now, for those of you who are maybe new to church, maybe you have an interesting relationship with church, you're a little anxious to be here, there's a lot of people here, it's kind of loud, there's some music, and then you hear the word blasphemy, you're like, oh no, why did I come to church today? (laughs) I just want to invite you to open your heart, to open your mind to God and what he might want to say to you today. I think the Lord has some really beautiful things for us in his word. And I'd hate for you to miss it because of a past experience or because of fear and anxiety. So really quickly, Pastor Sean last week brought us through Jesus as the servant king. Throughout the book of Matthew, St. Matthew has been dropping little references to the Old Testament. And he specifically last week had a, a reference to Isaiah. And then Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah prophesies, speaks forward to Israel of a king, a Messiah, a savior who would come, who was filled with the Holy Spirit. He would bring justice. He would save the people of God. And to top it all off, the nations, every people, every language, every ethnicity would put their hope in this Messiah. Now, We know and we believe that Jesus is that Messiah. Jesus isn't just the hope of the Jews. He is the hope of the whole world. He is the head of the church. He is our savior and yet our lover. So I want us to come today to Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 through 32 with all that in mind. Sound good? With that, will you all please stand for the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter 12, 22 through 32. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. He, Jesus, healed him so that the man could both speak and see. All the crowds were astounded and said, could this be the son of David? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. You guys can be seated. Will you all please join me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for your words. We thank you for scripture. We confess and believe that you are speaking to us through this book right now. We believe and confess that your Holy Spirit is here with us and seeking to dwell upon and in us. 
And so we just ask King Jesus, whatever we have in our lives that is keeping us separate from you, would you by your grace and love tenderly tear down those walls? Would you comfort your church? Would you convict your church, Jesus? We look at the book of Acts and we see you adding to the church and we confess and believe that there are those here now that you are adding to the church, not just numerically, but to the people of God and to the kingdom of God. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to them, that you would reveal their sins and that you would comfort them with your saving love. We ask, Jesus, that as we get into the scripture that you would open our eyes, open our ears to the truth. I ask, Lord, that you would bless me to speak your truth, that you would keep me from speaking anything that would be a stumbling block or false. We ask, Jesus, whatever is from you, that we would walk out of here remembering it, honoring it, with it on our lips and then in our heart. So Jesus, be with your church. Help us to love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. All right. For those of you who grew up in church, man, oh, man, passages like this, phrases like the unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin, that's the reason you're in therapy right now. Just kidding. But if you're new to Christianity, there's some inside baseball going on right now. There's kind of this concept that a lot of us in Western Christianity grew up with, uh, and we saw this, this phrase, the unforgivable sin, and maybe you're like me, you were just terrified of committing it. As a little child, you're like, oh man, I don't know what the unforgivable sin is, but I hope I haven't done it. Not only that, some of us would wonder, if we had done it, would we still be saved? I think that's a sentiment that a lot of us, even now, seem to struggle with, adults and children alike. We wonder, are we actually saved? Is it possible for us to lose our salvation? Or maybe we didn't get saved the right way. You don't have to raise your hands, but I wonder if many of you, like me, grew up in environments where predestination and election were really emphasized. And you wondered, am I elect? Am I actually saved? And instead of causing that to, causing us to cry out to God and seek him, it would cause anxiety and fear and doubt. We'd come to church and wonder, am I an outsider? Am I a black sheep? Do I really belong here? I remember being a little kid and thinking this. So whenever there was a, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I would shoot at my hand. And I can only help but think the people around me are like, man, why won't this kid stay saved? What is wrong with him? <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think a lot of us identify with these sentiments. And I don't wanna disparage a part of the body of Christ, I'm just saying that I think this is something a lot of us have in common. And I think the reason we might think this is because we misunderstand God's forgiveness. That's what I really wanna focus on today. We'll talk about a lot of topics. We'll get a brush through Matthew 12, but I really want us to focus on, think about, come to Jesus and ask him about his forgiveness. I think we misunderstand the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, I think we misunderstand the patience of God. I think we even misunderstand the justice, judgment, and plan of God too. As our passage details, we're not alone in our misunderstandings. There are other forces at play here. Even Jesus acknowledges that there are supernatural forces, evil forces, anti-God entities that would love nothing more than for you to doubt the love of God, the forgiveness of God, to doubt grace, to doubt love, to doubt patience. I think the enemy of our souls and the enemies of Christ would desire for us to believe one of two lies. 
I think Satan might be trying to convince some of you here that either one, you can't be forgiven, or two, you don't need to be forgiven. And so even here at the beginning of our sermon, I wanna invite you to think about this. I wanna invite you to open your heart to Jesus, open your heart to his Holy Spirit and say, Lord, am I believing one of these lies? Is one of these lies keeping me from relationship with you? Is one of these lies keeping me from intimacy with your Holy Spirit? Is one of these lies keeping me from fully participating in your body, fully singing out, wearing the priestly mantle and bringing a sacrifice of praise to you? I wanna invite you to consider that as we go through the text today. Christian, non-Christian, believer, or lost, I think we all have a tendency to believe one of these lies, that Jesus can't forgive us or that we don't need to be forgiven. So to properly understand the forgiveness and love of God and to understand how the enemy might try and punk us, let's go to the scriptures. Matthew chapter 12, and I'm gonna give us some context here. St. Matthew has been explaining to us that Jesus the Messiah is well into his messianic mission. If the word Messiah trips you up, it basically means the chosen king of God. And Matthew has made it abundantly clear that Jesus is a king that is unlike every other king. He gives rest. He doesn't ask us to strive. He gives us a yoke that is lighter and easier and better than every other yoke. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. Matthew has also been teasing out this idea that Jesus would bear the sins of the world. He's a great Messiah. And Matthew has also been systematically going through the Jewish religion and showing how Jesus fulfills different aspects of it. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He chooses to give life on the Sabbath. Jesus is greater than the temple. In fact, speaking of the temple where God's presence would dwell, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus has made it clear, speaking of sacrifices, he doesn't want them anymore, he wants mercy. Now this is really important for us, so tune in. The sacrifice God wants can only come from Jesus. Because of that, God desires mercy. But there are those in the book of Matthew who don't like that. They don't like these things about Jesus. All the things Jesus has been subverting, all the things Jesus has been fulfilling and redefining, the kingdom of God, the type of king God would send, the Sabbath, the temple of God, the sacrificial system, these are all so deeply important to a group of people named the Pharisees. And they are the religious rulers of Jesus' day. They keep the law of God so tightly and so closely and they hold the people of God, the nation of Israel, accountable to the law of God. That's how they see themselves. Why? Because the Pharisees had this key belief that God would only renew the nation of Israel. He would only send the Messiah when the nation was perfect, when the nation was holy, separate from the other nations. God would send his Messiah, his chosen king, to restore Israel once they were perfect. So imagine you're the Pharisees interacting with Jesus. It's been about 430 years since the nation has heard the voice of God. His presence is no longer in the temple, at least not like it used to be. The Messiah God promised is nowhere to be seen. And you believe it's all due to the fact that you as a nation keep dropping the ball because of sin. And here comes a man from Nazareth, Jesus. 
your perfect Sabbath rituals, your perfect temple and laws, Jesus redefines them. He fulfills them. And so you would naturally think as a Pharisee, this guy's the worst. He's ruining our chance at being a perfect nation. Ironically, Jesus came not for a perfect nation, but for imperfect sinners. And so you can see the Pharisees and Jesus are diametrically opposed in their mission. One has a mission for absolute sinless holiness, and one has a mission to save sinners and make them holy through love and forgiveness. The Pharisees don't hear God saying, I do not desire sacrifice, but I desire mercy. If they did, maybe they would see that Jesus is the sacrifice that God wants. And Jesus begins to expose the Pharisees' holy facade. They're not as holy as they think they are. They're actually full of pride. They're actually hypocrites. The word hypocrite means to put on a mask. So they have this mask of holiness, but a heart of sin and wickedness. Why do, the, why do the Pharisees love performing? Why are they hypocrites? Maybe I'm reading into this too much, but why do we love our rules? Why do we love legalism and have legalistic tendencies? Well, I think we can manipulate rules. We can manipulate religion. But it's so much harder to manipulate a person. It's so much harder to trick and game a person especially if that person is God. And so Jesus reveals the Pharisees' hearts by healing, saving, casting out demons, and preaching the gospel in the most humble, lowly way. So the Pharisees, they do what all of us do when we're embarrassed. They try to kill the person embarrassing them. Oh, not you guys, just me? Okay. In all seriousness, this will be the defining line in St. Matthew's account of Jesus' ministry. From here on out, the Pharisees are determined on discrediting Jesus and collecting evidence to put him to death. At this point, Matthew 12, 18, the author steps in, Matthew steps in to use the Old Testament prophet Isaiah to show us what Jesus is doing, who he is, and that he fulfills the old covenant. He's chosen by God. He's spirit-filled, carrying freedom and justice to victory. Yet, he's meek and mild. He wouldn't even snuff out a smoldering wick of a candle. Now, back then, for Jesus' contemporaries, and uh, people who lived in the early church age, the way scripture referencing worked was if you were to quote a portion of a passage, like Isaiah, everyone else listening would be able to find the reference in their mind and fill out the rest of the passage. So earlier, uh, Sean last week covered that Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 42. Let's practice what it would be like to uh, understand the full context. We'll put it up on the screen. Here's Isaiah 42, the rest of the verse, 7 and 8. In order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. So that's the context of what's happening. And it's almost as if Jesus is holding the scroll of Isaiah and saying, oh, okay, that's what's next. Matthew 12, 22, lo and behold, Jesus is confronted by a man who is imprisoned by dark demonic forces. Let's read verse 22. A demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man could speak and see. 
Now, this isn't necessarily a new or novel idea to us. We know that Jesus heals, amen? He heals then and he heals now. But what we haven't seen before is kind of this two-for-one demonic possession combo, okay? We've seen a demonic uh, person who can't speak, and we've seen a demonic person who can't see. Now, here in chapter 12, we've got both in one person. And it's as if Matthew is showing us there is no other name, no other power, no other entity that is above Jesus. Jesus is the name that is above every other name. Even though this passage opens up with spiritual warfare, um, I want us to keep it in the background of our mind because it's kind of setting the context of the passage, Um, but I don't want to uh, spend the whole sermon talking about it because I think we'd be uh, missing out what's really going on here. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Matthew is developing a theme in his gospel. The Messiah would bring justice. He would set the captives free. Now, everyone in Jesus' day and age is thinking that means localized human slavery or localized oppression and occupation. But Jesus' justice is freedom from unseen rulers and authorities. We just need to note that. We just need to have it in our minds. Let's look at verse 23. All the crowds were astounded and said, could this be the son of David? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man drives out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. All of a sudden, the crowds are starting to get it. They recognize that Jesus is the son of David, which is a messianic title. In fact, that's how the gospel of Matthew starts out. Jesus, the son of David. And it's almost as if someone in the crowd goes, you know what? I think that guy's the son of David. And the Pharisees go, how dare you? How dare you? The Pharisees blow a head gasket. They don't just try to discredit what Jesus is doing, but they discredit Jesus' person. They say that Jesus isn't operating by the Spirit of God, but he's operating by Beelzebul. Now, if you don't know who Beelzebul is, you can just tell by the name. That's not a good good name. In fact, that was the Jewish moniker, the Jewish nickname for Satan, Beelzebul. And they would use this nickname actually to make fun of Satan. In polite terms, Beelzebul means Lord of the Flies. More literally, it means the Lord of dung. So Jesus heals a demon-possessed man who's blind and mute. The crowds are like, I think this is the Messiah. And the Pharisees say, son of David? More like the Lord of dung. We just need to frame the ridiculousness that's happening here. This is uncalled for. It, It doesn't make any sense for the Pharisees to call out Jesus like this, to insult him like this. And I think if we notice that, we're gonna begin to see a pattern with how the Pharisees treat Jesus. It's clear to us the Pharisees have made an intellectual commitment to hate Jesus. The crowd identifies Jesus as the Messiah, but the Pharisees malign him with Satan. Matthew 12, verse 25 and 26. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So this is so cool. Jesus moves from healing a demoniac, casting out a demon, to reading their thoughts, okay? Jesus isn't just a healer. He's also divine. He's God. He's omniscient. He knows all things. And he understands through this the Pharisees' motives. It's as if he's reading what's written on their hearts. And so what's so interesting is Jesus will actually responds to their heart posture with a little bit of logic. Jesus will present them with a parable to show how ridiculous their insult is. Jesus uses an illustration of a kingdom. 
And he says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, if a town is divided against itself or a house, how then can it stand? And Jesus hangs them over their presupposition in verse 26. If Satan is divided against himself, can he really win? If Satan is casting out Satan, how is he gonna gain any ground? And then in verse 27, Jesus continues. If I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? So Jesus is referencing Jewish exorcists. Jewish exorcists would have these long formulaic exorcism formulas. We're talking like everything, the kitchen sink, the holy water, the rotten vegetables in the fridge, they're just like throwing it all at the demons just to get the demons to budge. But all Jesus has to say is get out, and they're gone. And so Jesus points to the fact, your sons think they're exercising demons by the Spirit of God. If that's what they're doing, then what do you think I'm doing? If all I have to say is get out and the demons flee, what's different? And then in verse 28, Jesus offers them an alternative. He's in fact not casting out demons by Satan. He has authority over them by the Holy Spirit, which implies that the kingdom of God has come through Jesus's ministry. Verse 29, Jesus will continue and give them another sort of parable to understand what he's doing. He says, how can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Jesus is showing us an aspect of his ministry on earth. Yes, he came to save and seek the lost. Yes, he came to bring the kingdom of God. But he also came to destroy the kingdom of the enemy. Jesus doesn't have to prove anything to the Pharisees, but in grace and mercy, he's meeting them in his logic, in their logic. He's showing them what you're saying is so ridiculous right now. Look with me into the spiritual realm and let's understand that this doesn't make sense. In fact, what I'm actually doing is I'm tying up the strong man of the house. I'm binding him and throwing him out so that I can win my children back. What I find interesting is Jesus isn't only stealing from Satan, but Jesus has bound Satan. What does that mean? I think we'll glean some understanding if we look to the Psalms. This is Psalm 82, verse 1 through 8. God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the needy. Save them from the power of the wicked. They do not know or understand. They wander in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Verse six, this is God speaking. He says, I said you are gods. You are all sons of the most high. However, you will die like humans and fall like any other ruler. Now, this is the psalmist, verse 8. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So the author of the Gospel of Matthew is showing us whenever Jesus casts out a demon, that's what's taking place. God is judging spiritual entities that have power over the nations, and he's getting ready to evict them and bring in all of his children. And so when, whenever we see an exorcism in the book of Matthew, I just want you to see that as a snapshot of judgment upon the demonic and the freedom of the nations. Again, we could turn this into a whole other sermon about Jesus's cosmic mission to destroy the devil. We'll save that for another time. Let's look at verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me. Anyone who does not gather with me 
scatters. Jesus further details the war he's fighting, but he moves from the spiritual to the physical, and he actually tells us there's not just supernatural evil against him, there is physical human evil that is against him. And I think when we read the word gather and scatter, it's supposed to activate our Bible memory, okay? So if you're new to the Bible and you're new to the church, I think this is supposed to help us recite the exile of Israel. The exile is a keystone moment in Israel's history where they have, uh, God gives them a king and the king's awful and then there's David and David's great and it's downhill from there. <laughs> That's the Old Testament in a nutshell. But eventually it comes to a point where the kings of Israel are sacrificing their own sons on the altars of false demonic gods. God says, I'm not gonna have that. And so what God does to punish his son Israel is he brings in other nations, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians. And what God does is he has them basically sack Israel and they take the people out and bring them to their nations as slaves. The word scatter here is the same Greek word in the Greek Old Testament that talks about the exile. Let's look at Ezekiel 5, verse 12. A third of your people will die by plague and be consumed by famine within you. A third will fall by the sword all around you, and I will scatter a third to every direction of the wind, and I will draw a sword to chase after them. So this exile theme is supposed to help us think of God's holiness, God's justice, God's judgment, but also God's loving discipline to bring his son back to repentance. When I say his son, I mean Israel as a nation. But after a time, the nation of Israel and the people actually do repent. Their life in these other nations is awful, and they cry out to God. They ask for mercy and forgiveness. They Repent. Again, if you're new to church, new to the Bible, repent is a Bible word that means to turn back to God. And God allows them to turn back to Israel. He gathers them back to their home. Their spiritual repentance results in a physical return to their homeland and to God. And Jesus is using this language of scatter and gather to color the seriousness of the spiritual reality he's talking about. Those who are with him, physically and spiritually, are the true people of God. He has gathered them up. Those who are not with him, however, those who are unrepentant, who will not turn back to God, are scattered they're judged and sent out like the nation of Israel. Let's look at verse 31. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks a word against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. I think this verse is pretty straightforward, so let's move on. Oh, okay, let's, let's, let's park it here. I'm just kidding, this verse is crazy. Before we take a crack at understanding what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, we need to wrestle with what I think is a more outrageous claim by Jesus. Jesus forgives all sin. I cannot tell you guys how many times as a pastor I hear seasoned Christians struggling with the belief that Jesus forgives them. And I don't say that to shame you. I say that to bring, uh, to bring awareness to this reality that we need to constantly receive the forgiveness of Jesus. To be forgiven, to repent is not a one-time thing. It is a lifestyle of a disciple of Jesus. It is a pattern to emulate, to practice. Mothers and fathers, practice it with your family, display it to your kids, uh, repent and forgive each other so that we are reminded 
that we are forgiven by Jesus. Remember how the Pharisees thought Israel had to be perfect. They thought Israel had to be sinless for the Messiah to come. Well, if that was true, Jesus would have never come. We'd be without a savior, stuck in the law. To believe that God can't forgive your sins is to believe that your sin is greater than God's love and forgiveness. And I just want to gently invite you to that fact today. I don't think your Christian victory will come by white knuckling it. I think your Christian victory will come by recognizing that Jesus loves you and forgives you. You might be thinking, but Andrew, you don't understand what I've done. You don't know who I am. You don't know the things that I've done with my hands, my eyes, my body. And you might be right. I don't know you. I don't know the things most of you guys have struggled with. But Jesus does. I know that's scary. But if most of us, I believe if we would come to grips with the worst sins we've sinned and we brought them to Jesus, you would experience massive life change. Amen. You might lose friends. You might lose reputation. You might lose dignity. But man, you will gain a new perspective on how much God loves you. I want to read you one of my favorite Bible verses. I try to read this daily for myself, for my wife and my son. This is Psalm 103. This is David saying, My soul, bless the Lord. All that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and he crowns you with faithful love and compassion. That word iniquity means sin. Church, how much, how much sin does God forgive? All of your sin. And this isn't like nice thoughts about God painted in the women's bathroom of church. We don't do that here, but you get the idea. This was written by David, King David, okay? If you don't know him, this is who he is. He committed adultery. He got the woman pregnant that he committed adultery with. To cover up his sin of adultery, he had the woman's husband murdered. If all of his sins are forgiven, if he can write these things about God, and you now have a better revelation, a better picture of the love and forgiveness of God in Jesus, there's no excuse keeping you from his forgiveness. There's no lie that can stand up to the cross of Jesus. So even now, before we end the sermon, I want you to begin to ask yourself that question. Why haven't I received the forgiveness of Jesus? Why haven't I brought my sin to him? Here's the thing. The Bible is full of people like you and me. David isn't the only screw up. Noah, he was a drunk. Abraham, he slept with his wife's maid. Isaac cheated his uncle. Rahab was a prostitute, Moses was a murderer, David was an adulterer and a murderer, Solomon had 700 wives, Jonah ran from God, Samson lived a loose life, Peter denied Christ, the disciples were selfish and immature, Martha was worried about everything, Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed, Zacchaeus was a cheater, Paul murdered Christians, and Peter was prejudiced. If God can forgive them, God can forgive you. These are all people who had their sins forgiven and were used by God. Church, 
Jesus is stretching out his hand to you. He loves you and wants to forgive you. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, we're not done, but some of you now are feeling convicted about needing to confess your sin, needing to ask for forgiveness, and I wanna encourage you. As soon as service ends, don't play around, don't do the game, should I go up, should I not go up? Just do it. Come up to the prayer team. Find a brother or sister in the chairs next to you. Confess your sin and plead the blood of Jesus on your life. He wants to cleanse you from all sin and unrighteousness. So, what is the unforgivable sin? What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Let me start by saying there's an immediate context here. And I wanna start with the immediate context and I wanna develop it into the overall context that Matthew is trying trying to paint for us. In the immediate context of the book of Matthew, Jesus is casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees say, that's Beelzebul, that's Satan. So in essence, in the immediate context, knowingly, out of spite and hatred, calling the work of the Spirit of God, the work of Satan, is blasphemy. Now that's what's happening right here, right now, Matthew 12. Let's try and create a principle out of it. Let's see the picture that Matthew's painting for us. And let's actually start by asking a question. If you go out of here and someone's praying in tongues, someone gives a word of knowledge, someone's praying for healing, and I go, That's witchcraft. Is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I tend to think not, and here's why. I think that's pretty dumb to do, so don't do that. (laughs) The context of this story has to be taken into consideration of the developing relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees. We talked about it earlier. The Pharisees hate Jesus. They're sick of him. They're ready to kill him. He's ruining their party, he's ruining their rules, and they're plotting his murder. And this didn't just happen after one encounter. This has been developing through the book of Matthew. Here's the thing about the Pharisees. They know. They know that Jesus is the Messiah. They had their eyes glued to the scriptures, waiting for this man to come. And he's come. He's come, but they reject him. Because Jesus is operating by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has now arrived, and Jesus is detailing what his kingdom looks like, and the Pharisees don't like that kingdom. They want another kingdom. I think if we look at Matthew carefully, we see the Pharisees for who they are, we will see them hardening their hearts against Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. And it should remind us, actually, of the Exodus, the second book of the Bible, King Pharaoh, who is oppressing, enslaving the Israelites. He's confronted by Moses, a messenger of God, and Pharaoh hardens his heart to God. He hardens his heart to the point of no return. And so I think that's what's happening here with the Pharisees. We're getting a live look at what it looks like to sear your conscience, harden your heart, and close your life off from the work of God. And it's a calculated decision. It's not that they don't believe God can forgive them. They know he can, but they won't ask for forgiveness They won't repent. They won't turn to God. When talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, pastor and theologian Tim Keller said this. On the one hand, speaking externally, with regard to action, there's no sin that is unforgivable. God can forgive any sin. 
On the other hand, speaking internally with regard to unrepentance, there is no sin that is forgivable. When we decide in our hearts that we won't repent, God cannot forgive that. That is unforgivable because you are not willing to come before God and confess the truth, that you're a sinner in need of a savior. It's been said before, and I'm gonna say it again, the appropriate pastoral counsel for this passage, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, is that if you're afraid you've done it, you haven't done it. The work of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Ghost is to convict us of sin, righteousness, and empower us. So if you're experiencing anxiety and fear of blaspheming the Spirit of God, that's good. That means the Holy Spirit is convicting you. He is convincing you. So you can tell your therapist, your pastor said your anxiety is from God. Just kidding. It's a sign the Spirit is moving in your life. If you feel conviction, conviction means to convince. If you feel convinced that what you're doing is wrong, if you feel convinced that you need to honor God and live a holy life, that's good news. The Spirit of God is at work in you. In the summer of 2004, I listened to my first hardcore album. The name of this album was Their Only Chasing Safety by a little known band, you might have heard of them, called Under Oath. Now, if all the words I just said confuse you, little generational update right here. Screamy music, screamy Jesus music, okay? That's what I was listening to in fourth grade. Now, I'm not gonna analyze the lyrics of this album, but I do want to bring your attention, awareness to the last song of the album. It was entitled, some will seek forgiveness, others will escape. The song is about receiving God's grace and those who reject God's grace. And there's a lyric in the song that kind of paints an allusion to Judas. I want us to think Momentarily, could Judas have been forgiven? He certainly chose not to be forgiven, that's for sure. Again, I want us to just take a step back and look at some literary themes in the book of Matthew. The people who consistently put themselves out of reach of Jesus' arms are the religious well-to-do, the Pharisees. But those who meet Jesus' outstretched arms are the destitute, the broken, those whose lives are spun out and crumbling, overwhelmed in sin. Now, it's not to say that if you've been a Christian for a long time, that you've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or hardened your heart or anything like that. But it does mean that we can callous our hearts to the point of not wanting God's grace. And we need to be careful of that. I even want us to recognize that Jesus doesn't even necessarily say they've confitted, uh, confitted, <laughs> committed <clears throat> the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He's warning them against it. And in verse 33 through 36, Sean will preach on this next week, he is calling them to analyze the fruit of their lives. And he says, the fruit of your life will be emblematic of the root of the tree. So how do you tell a tree? How do, you, how do you know what kind of a tree you're looking at? at bleh, words. How do you know what kind of a tree you're looking at is? You look at its fruit. And if the fruit is bad, you're looking at a bad tree. And so I think we're meant to apply this to ourselves. If you're at risk of blaspheming the Holy Spirit with your mouth, it's because you have an inward life that is already resisting God, resisting his grace. Those who truly end up blaspheming the Holy Spirit are those who are trying to escape the forgiveness of Jesus. Remember what we talked about in the beginning. The enemy of our souls and the enemy of our Lord wants us to believe one of two lies. That you can't be forgiven 
or that you don't need to be forgiven. The Pharisees thought they didn't need forgiveness. They thought their works and righteousness would bring the kingdom of God, but it didn't. It brought their downfall. I wonder right now if you feel like that, if you're a person who is resisting forgiveness. Maybe you're not. Maybe you feel like you're here today in church and you don't belong. Maybe you feel like when God forgives you, it's just out of obligation. You're a second-rate Christian, maybe. You still see yourself as the person who did that unspeakable thing. For the Pharisee and for the downcast, for the religious, for the sinner, I wanna lead us to Psalm chapter 103. We're gonna read the rest of the chapter. And it's actually a really long passage, so if you have your Bible, would you open up to Psalm 103, verse eight. Psalm 103, verse eight. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our, our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows that we are made or he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. As for man, his days are like the grass. He blooms like a flower of the field. When the wind passes over it, it vanishes, and its place is no longer known. If you believe that you can't be forgiven, I need you to know. God is wanting to remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. Your application is to fix your eyes on that truth, to worship, come to God, confess your sins, and know that in the act of confession, God forgives you and removes your sins. If you believe you don't need forgiveness, you need to remember your days are like the grass. You don't know when your life will end. You don't know when you will find yourself in the hands of the living God. There's an invitation to find repentance, to find forgiveness, to find love in the eyes of Jesus. I'd like to invite the communion team and the prayer team up. And we're gonna close responding to grace, love, and forgiveness of Jesus. With that church, will you please stand with me and seek God in prayer? Jesus, we don't want to be negligent of your grace, your mercy and forgiveness. And so we just ask now for those of us who have hardened our hearts, those of us who have removed our hearts from your reach, would you draw us near? Would you soften the hearts made of stone? Would you convict those who said they don't need to be convinced of their sin? Would you comfort those who believe that their sin is too great? Would you lead us, Jesus, to be a church who is sensitive to your spirit, sensitive to your leading, who rejoices daily in the fact that we are forgiven? We love you, Jesus. We just ask that you would help us to love you more. And it's in your name we pray, amen.